All right, let's take a look at how the African continent is doing in advancing women and girls in the science field. I'm now joined um, via Zoom by Dr. Elizabeth Mgawankandawriwe from the FSIFSnet, African Network and Research Manager. Dr. Elizabeth, thank you for your time and for joining us on our program this afternoon. You were able to listen in on that beautiful package put together by Newsroom Africa reporter Zikona Chona, speaking to some of the women, especially young girls in the field of science sharing some of their challenges within the industry perhaps expand on those challenges for us okay so i guess i can talk from personal experience um i think for me i was a little bit more privileged than most women um, because one thing that they don't teach you in formal curriculums is that the informal work environment and the Formal, uh, the, the formal work environment and the informal home environment very rarely remain separate. So um, when I became pregnant, this actually, when I became pregnant with my first child, um, it became more stark to me because I started to think about, okay, so um, what, do, what happens to my child um, when I need to go back to work? I, my family lives very far away, so what, what are the implications for me continuing in my field of research or continuing to work? Fortunately for me, and why I say I'm privileged, is that my line manager, who was also female, allowed me six months um, at home. And what that meant is I could gradually ease myself back into work. So I'd go in maybe four hours at a time and increase that as my child grew older. Um, but not all women are privileged to have that. Most women have to go back to work after three months maternity leave. Um, and if they don't have the right support system in place, this has really significant implications for them. You know, I mean, um, it, it makes it extremely challenging for them. And so we're seeing this in the numbers as well, because um, about 33% of uh, researchers in Africa are women. And those numbers, of course, vary from country to country. But if we look at South Africa, for example, which is on the higher end, 45% um, are, are, are actually women, 45% of researchers. But like Ndombi pointed out, many of these researchers are not in leadership positions. And that has to do with what I mentioned earlier about the lack of separation between the formal work environment and the informal um, home environment. Uh, so I'll give you an example. In academia, in order to get promoted, uh, some of the criteria for promotion are things like publishing, uh, things like um, making sure you can secure funding. But if you look at a regular nine to five day, you're teaching, you're meeting with students, you're marking papers, you're invigilating. Uh, in COVID times, you're preparing online uh, classes to teach, which is actually far more time consuming. So by the time you look at your clock, it's five o'clock and you need to go to your other job, which is looking after your kids, uh, cooking, cleaning, homework, all of that, um, which means by the time you actually have a moment to yourself, it's 10, 11 o'clock at night. So it's either you extend your day so that you can work on a publication or work on a funding application, or you postpone that until your children are a little bit more independent. Um, so those are some of the real challenges that women are facing in terms of getting into leadership positions. Mm. And Dr. Elizabeth, I want us now to focus on the why. Why is it that the environment is still not conducive enough for women to occupy positions within the field of science? And I want us to, because you're speaking from a, a position of personal experience, and you know, one thing that caught my attention was the fact that you mentioned how difficult it was even to, you know, to take proper full maternity leave and issues like that. But your view with inside the industry, what do you think is the reason that, you know, some policies within the field are still not changed to somewhat way accommodate women? I think part of the challenge is that there's not enough women in leadership positions to use their experience to influence these policies, to influence this change. Um, so, I mean, if you look, for example, at um, an any institution, um, if you have open plan offices um, and you say, okay, women need to come back to work after three months, and the WHO, the, uh, the, the national policy is telling us women need to breastfeed exclusively. If you have an open plan space and a woman is unable to pump breast milk and 
no, it is not okay to pump breast milk in the toilet. Mm. There's something in the system that's not working. And I think part of it has to do with the fact that we don't have enough women in leadership positions to use their influence, to use their positions to influence policy and to influence change. I suppose, Dr. Elizabeth, then one can sort of imagine the impact that, you know, the current status environment, you know, that is not conducive enough for young women to join might be in some way viewed as very discouraging. So now what do you think, in your view, needs to be done to help, you know, promote, encourage young girls to boldly walk into this industry? So um, currently I work at the University of Pretoria for the Food Systems Research Network for Africa, or FSNet Africa as we call it. And through this project, we are... Um, trying to increase the capacity of researchers uh, in six different countries. And we made deliberate efforts to uh, select female researchers. Um, and 80% of our cohort is actually female. Um, but because they're early career, one of the things that we recognize is that most of them are in their childbearing years. So integrated into our planning mechanisms are ways in which we can ensure that um, the researchers can fully benefit from the fellowship. So if it means that they need to travel to events and training activities along with their baby and a nanny um, to support them, then that's what we need to do. Mm. Um, and through the program, we are also um, ensuring that women themselves um, build their networks, they uh, are able to publish, but that even the men in our cohort are provided with the knowledge or equipped with the tools to be able to influence that institutional change. So they're not just going to become leaders. Um, we're not just trying to increase the numbers, the numbers, the numbers. We're trying to also uh, empower them to be able to say that when you get into this position, what do you need to think about to be able to open doors for other women to take up these leadership positions? What do you need to do? And I think more projects like FSNet Africa are needed um, that really not only increase the numbers, but address these in institutional and policy, like you mentioned, policy barriers for women and girls entering the sciences. Now, lastly, before I let you go, and I want us to look at the African continent as a whole, um, when we're comparing the numbers and statistics of women within the field of science in all the countries, in your view, which country is much more better? And perhaps what are the role players in these different countries doing in as far as sharing the relevant information to help, you know, you know, introduce more women into this field and make it a much more, you know, comfortable position for them. So um, I think South Africa is one of the countries that is doing well. I mean, we haven't advanced to a stage where we can say that any one country has addressed these sort of underlying factors um, that really prevent women from progressing. So South Africa is doing well in terms of the numbers. And I think part of it has to do with the fact that they have policies. They're investing in the women. They're investing in young girls and bringing them up. But we need to do more because it's not just about the numbers, like I said. Mm -hmm. It's about driving that institutional change. It's about driving that policy change. And, you know, I did mention that I'm going to let you go after that question. But then, you know, it, it's a personal story, not only for me, but I think for many girls, you know, the fear that is built around math and science across the entire continent, especially in South Africa as well, among schools, is that students or children, especially young girls, are brought up in a sense where they are taught that science is difficult. You won't be able to do it. How do we change that narrative moving forward? I think what is needed is role models. Um, if, if we can put, again, women in leadership positions, that is going to influence change. But also um, education is important. So what goes out into the media is, 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 is critical. Um, you know, when we do advertising, who is featured on uh, pamphlets that are advertising engineering courses? Who is featured? So it's that whole mindset that we need to change in society itself, change parents' um, perceptions so that when they're raising their kids, they're able to say, 
Yes, you're a girl, but go and study engineering. Yes, you're a girl. Don't be afraid of maths. Maths is not that bad. Maths can be for girls. It can be for girls and boys mm -hmm. equally. So we need to have that mind, mind, mindset shift. And I think we also need to educate the men um, so that they can help to open up these spaces for women. Well, Dr. Elizabeth, thank you so much for your time and joining us on our program. May you continue to do the great work in encouraging young girls into joining the field of science.